Hello everyone, Eric here. Welcome to yet another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast. Thank you for joining me. I am very excited to have Edward O'Donnell with me today. He is a professor with the Department of History at Holy Cross College. He is the author of several books as well, including Henry George and the Crisis of Inequality, Progress and Poverty in the Gilded Age, and 1001 Things Everyone Should Know About Irish American History. And he's here to discuss with me his book, Ship Ablaze, The Tragedy of the Steamboat General Slocum. Great to have you on. Thank you so much. Great to be here. So, do you remember when you first heard about the Slocum tragedy? And how did it go from idea to book? Yes, I remember very distinctly. I was a graduate student at Columbia University in New York City, and I was a teaching assistant in the New History of New York City class taught by the great Ken Jackson. And at one point he said, all right, who can tell me, and this is about 100 students, who can tell me uh, what the greatest fire in New York City history was? And a whole bunch of hands shot up and a whole bunch of answers were the Triangle Fire, the one with the factory, the when the women jumped out the window, 1911. And he said, those are all great answers and they're all completely wrong. There was a greater fire that was seven times greater in terms of death seven years earlier and it's totally forgotten. And it's the fire aboard the General Slocum. And so that always stuck in my mind. And I remember like looking up the story and getting a little more information on it. And for, at, the, at that point, it was just more of a, a trivia question and a kind of stumper question. But years later, when I was looking around to, to write a book for, uh, quite honestly, for a mass audience, you know, I do both scholarly work that is aimed at, you know, that only other historians will read. And then I also like to do work that, uh, we'll get it out there into the general public. And so I was toying with a bunch of ideas and the re- writing about the fire, especially because the 100th anniversary was approaching in uh, 2004. I thought that would be a perfect hook for it. Um, and then, you know, I, I ended up uh, pitching it to my agent. He pitched it to Random House. And we signed the contract. And then seven months later, uh, 9-11 happened. And so suddenly this forgotten fire became much more well-known because reporters and everybody else began grasping for historical precedents for deadly days in New York City history, you know, the great fire during the American Revolution, cholera epidemics, and the General Slocum Fire of 1904. So the General Slocum, it was a passenger steamer that had seen better days, right? Yep. Would you give us the history of the ship, describe it for us, what did it look like? What were its capabilities? Yeah, so the General Slocum was launched in 1893. So it wasn't that old. It was just sort of old compared to some of the other boats that came out after it had been launched. So when it first was launched in 1893, it was sort of the queen of the New York waterways. But, uh, you know, five, six years later, there were bigger and more impressive boats. So this was a twin paddle wheel steamer, and it was about 300 feet in length and made almost entirely out of wood. And its sole purpose was to uh, transport people on excursions. So you could rent it out and and take it to, you know, you load it up with your church group or load it up with your neighborhood association and head on out to a picnicking area on Long Island. And that's what the, you know, the the event that happened on June 15th, 1904 uh, was a church outing. And so they were doing what many other groups had done. There were other times you could buy a ticket on the Slocum to go out and watch the yacht races that would be taking place. So it was it was pretty all purpose excursion liner that pretty much stayed within the immediate New York waterways. It held well I'm sorry, by today's standards it would probably hold about 800 people, but at the time I think it was registered to hold up to 2500 people. So different standards in those days. Right, right. And it was named after a Civil War general, correct? Right. A, a lesser known Civil War general, but one who uh, was from the New York area. And after the war, Henry Warner Slocum uh, settled in or he was in Brooklyn and ran for Congress and served a couple of terms in Congress. So he was both a Civil War general for the Union Army and later a pretty well-known uh, congressman. So there's a statue of him in uh, Brooklyn. And for some reason, we can't, don't quite know, the owners of the company, they only had two ships and they named one uh, the Grand Republic and they named the other uh, General Slocum. It, it was an impressive looking ship, right? V- very majestic. 
It was, you know, it's, it's right out of that grand era of steamboats. And so 300 feet in length, bright white in its coloring, two paddle wheels. And if you were on the water, you know, let's, let's say on the shore or in a small boat, or even a large boat on the East River when it was taking people out on excursions, it was quite the sight to see, you know, people jammed on the ship, usually in their Sunday best, because this was always a big occasion to get out on a uh, steamer like this, and music playing, and people all lined up along the railing watching, you know, the city go by. So it, it was a very well-known uh, vessel, so that when the fire occurred, people people immediately knew what vessel that people were talking about. Right. The, the interior was luxurious, you write. Mm-hmm. It had plush carpeting, fine paintings, wood carvings, huge windows. Yep, curtains, everything, you know, beautifully painted. And it tended to paint it once uh, you know, at the start of the season and also, uh, you know, shiny varnish on all the, uh, all the wood. Uh, so it really had, and this was early in the season for 1904, so it was looking particularly polished and beautiful. Right. Would you tell us about the ship's captain? Yeah, so the captain was William Van Shake, and he was probably close to 70 years old and one of the best known captains in the, you know, in the waters around New York City. He had been doing this kind of work, uh, piloting boats, captaining boats in the New York area for decades. And he had a, basically a spotless safety record. And just the year before, he had actually been given an award for his sterling safety record. So he was uh, a person in, that people trusted and for good reason up until the, the day of the Great Fire. Yeah, you write that he had been honored for transporting 30 million passengers without a fatality. That, if true, is, is an incredible safety record. Right. You wonder if that number is how hard, how many people, where that number came from. But certainly just, a, you know, an astonishing number of people over a 50-year career uh, with no fatalities. I mean, nobody has a career with no accidents. That's just not going to happen. But he was seen as someone who just simply had a, a, a high degree of experience and also was careful. So while Van Shake was a well-respected, experienced, smart captain, the owner of the ship, a man named Frank Barnaby, was mostly concerned with saving a buck, right? Right. He was a dabbler, right? He, his main line of work was, commercial, it was real estate, and he was very good at that. He was very wealthy. And for some reason, he ended up buying the Knickerbocker Steamboat Company and had two, had a two steamboats. And it was just another, you know, what we'd say today, another revenue stream. So he was not interested in safety and necessarily running the company particularly well, but he saw it as a, as a way to earn an extra stream of income. In just a few weeks before the disaster, the ship had passed its annual inspection with flying colors. Right. So uh, in those days, regulations on steamships were pretty uh, common because there were more of them and there were plenty of accidents in the mid to late 19th century involving steam vessels. So the forerunner to the U.S. Coast Guard, uh, the Steamboat Inspection Service, uh, would send somebody around, an inspector, to check out the boats, make sure they were seaworthy, make sure they had enough life preservers, fire hoses and all of that, and then sign off for the season. And that's exactly what happened just a few weeks earlier. A inspector went around the General Slocum and spent very little time there, didn't really do too much of an inspection, particularly of the life preservers or the fire hoses, and signed off on it. And, you know, after the fire, people looked into this guy's training and also the, the way the U.S. Steamboat Inspection Service was run. And it was very a very corrupt, very inept agency, full of nepotism and um, not a whole lot of oversight. So, Frank Lundberg, the inspector, had been trained by simply following another inspector for a couple of weeks, and then he was deemed, you know, a, a certified inspector. Uh, so he didn't bring a lot of rigor and certainly not a lot of concern to his job, because in the aftermath, it was very clear that the vessel was certainly seaworthy, but the life preservers had never been swept, you know, replaced. So the, they had been hanging above the decks in racks for 13 uh, years, just in a, you know anything about the ocean that anything sitting in near the ocean for that long is going to you know corrode and be and be done in by all that salt, all that water, all that you know cold temperatures, hot temperatures, and so the life preservers were most of them were pretty useless, and the fire hoses same thing they were all rotted through so that when water 
flowed through them, they, they burst. And, and the lifeboats, typically they're tied in place. But in the case of the General Slocum, they were wired in place. Right. They're often, it depends on the boat, but they're often either tied in place just with a couple of lines that you can, un, you know, if you know anything about boats, basically affixed to a cleat and it takes about one second to undo them, or they're hanging off of what they call davits. And so they could be swung out over the side. And so there were a number of lifeboats up on the top deck, but they were, you know, if you're not that concerned about safety, they're kind of a pain in the neck. They, in rough weather, they get jostled all over the place. And so the, at some point in years earlier, they had just decided to wire them to the deck so that they were essentially, you know, almost permanently affixed uh, to the deck. So they were not going to be ready, not going to be available, you know, in a tight time frame during some sort of, sort of an emergency. And the life preservers, they were filled with cork. That's right. The original life preserver, uh, and certainly the, or the kind of life preserver that we would recognize, the sort of thing that goes around your neck and hangs in front of you like a vest. Uh, the original f- flotation mechanism within them were large blocks of cork, and they worked pretty well. But the problem is that cork, over time, like the exterior of the life preservers, will deteriorate in all that sun and heat and salt air. And that's exactly what happened. So that many of these life preservers, when people pulled them down during the uh, the fire, turned out they were basically, the, the cork had crumbled. So it was basically cork dust which of course is not buoyant at all. It's not going to hold you up like a block of cork, which is filled with air and is actually going to make a great flotation device. Quite the opposite. These light preservers filled with cork dust, when that cork dust gets wet, it's like sand or like flour. You know, it's just, it's going to actually weigh you down, literally performing the exact opposite function of a life preserver. Right, right. And, and I do want to ask you more about that in a bit as the tragedy is unfolding. Yep. I would love to talk about the passengers, though. They were mostly parishioners from St. Mark's Lutheran Church, right? Yeah, St. Mark's Lutheran Church was, you know, one of hundreds of churches in Manhattan. And this one was situated in the neighborhood that was known as Little Germany or Klein Deutschland. And that had been the largest German neighborhood um, outside of Germany uh, in the world in the 1860s, 1870s, uh, on up to the turn of the century. And this was one of its many churches. It also had some synagogues. And so St. Mark's had really been a kind of a pillar of the neighborhood. And somewhere about in the 1880s, the minister had hit upon the idea of having kind of an end of the year annual picnic in June, end of the, you know, the, the school year, end of the Sunday school year, beginning of the summer. And it started out as a small affair uh, that you know, they would go to a local park and then eventually grad, you know, grew to be the, to involve them hiring a steamboat to go off to a picnic area on Long Island, you know, have a full day of sun and fun and food and music and all of that. So that's the church that was unlucky enough to have rented the General Slocum on June 15th, 1904. The pastor is a central figure in your story. Mm-hmm. He was considered a really kind and gentle man, George Haas was his name. Right. And Reverend Haas was uh, really the pillar of the, he was the pillar of the church, but also in some ways the pillar of the, of the neighborhood. He was absolutely beloved. He was a very brilliant man and constantly was getting offers to take pastorships at other churches in other fancier or nicer neighborhoods or college professor positions. And he kept turning them down all of his life. He spent the rest of his life, you know, many decades in that little Germany church in Manhattan. And so he was really, you know, he's in this wonderful position uh, every year of being kind of the host of this super fun event that everybody wants to go on. Uh, And then in, unfortunately, in June of 1904, he's the host of the event that really goes awry and turns out to be one of the great disasters. Could you describe where this group was headed that day, what their plans were? Yes. So on June 15th, 1904, the, the itinerary was that people would gather on the, on a pier on the East River at East Third Street, so lower Manhattan, right near the, you know, as part of the German, Little Germany neighborhood. And they would board the the vessel around 830 and then head up the East River, which separates Manhattan from Brooklyn, and then on out into Long Island Sound, uh, which is the air body of water that separates Long Island from Connecticut. And somewhere along the coast of of Long Island, there would be a picnic area that they had rented. And this, this particular one was called Locust Grove. And you'd pull the steamer up to a pier, people would get out, and it's, you know, a beautiful couple hundred acres of land, beautiful beaches, 
playground equipment, um, a full area for with bathrooms and, and food vendors and lots of beautiful lawn to gather on. So it was a really set up to be a wonderful day. And then somewhere around four o'clock, they'd all get back on board the boat, all hungry uh, and sunburned and many people perhaps a little bit tipsy and then make their way back to the city. And again, this is they had done this year after year. So this was everybody had high expectations uh, for this event. And they also got a spectacular day. You know, it turned out to be, you know, the one thing you worry about in that circumstance is you worry that it might rain. And of course, they wake up on June 15th, 1904, and it's absolutely perfect. One of those sort of dreamy days in mid-June where the sky is blue and the sun is warm, the breeze is blowing, and it just like seems like a perfect day to go out on the water. There was music, a seven-piece band on board playing uh, both German and American songs, and two policemen accompanied the group as well, right? Right. So they wanted to make sure that they had somebody there to uh, keep everything safe. And who knows? They, there may have been incidents in the past where people got a little too tipsy or what have you. But they had two policemen on board just to sort of, you know, give the sense that everything was going to be safe, everything was going to be under control. Yeah. Uh, amidst all of the revelry, there is a hint early on, that things will not go as planned, or at least that people are concerned that they won't go as planned. A woman named Mrs. Philip Straub had boarded with her family. Right. And as she and her family waited for the deckhands to haul up the gangplank, she suddenly had a premonition, a dark premonition, you write. Yes. And there were a number of stories like like that where people suddenly felt uneasy because, you know, in 1904, most Americans, let alone immigrants that have, you know, very busy lives, uh, don't know how to swim. And so it's it's exciting to be on a boat like this, but it's also a little bit terrifying. And she had second thoughts and, you know, scampered off the boat. There were other stories of people that had that would later say, yeah, while we were getting ready, I had this uneasy feeling, but I decided to stay on board the boat. Yeah. She actually confides to a stranger, the guy sitting next to her, that she believes something bad is about to happen. And then he looks at her, doesn't say a word, gathers up his family, and and they run off the ship. (laughs) Right. And then her family follows his, right? Right. (laughs) It's, um, you know, kind of groupthink there. And you know, the fact that that man did that was probably indicative of the fact that while he probably was smiling and his family was enjoying things, he was really nervous. He was, you know, like when people are when you're taking off on an airplane, uh, there's a lot of people that, that are just staring at their magazines or watching the video screen or looking out the window, but they're playing it cool inside. They're really, really nervous, you know. And so the moment she suggests this premonition to this guy, that's all he needs to you know, whisk everybody off off the boat. So... When and where does the fire begin? How far along were they on the trip when it happened? And the origin of the of the fire, it's not known exactly how it starts, but there are theories. Right. The, the place of the fire is pretty well known, but the origin and how long it had been burning, nobody quite knows. But they're about only about 10 minutes into the journey uh, up the East River. They're, they're right next to Roosevelt, what we call Roosevelt Island now. And at the time was Blackwell's Island. And as they're pulling along there, so they're roughly, you know, if you're doing the grid of New York City, they're in the East 80s. And a a deckhand is sitting, if we can talk about another different world, uh, he was, a deckhand is sitting at the bar having a mid early morning beer when a uh, young boy comes running up to him and says, Mr. There's smoke coming up the stairs. And so he heads on, you know, somewhat reluctantly because he's pretty sure the kid has just seen a puff of steam. He heads downstairs to a storage room, and lo and behold, there is a smoldering fire in this storage room, storage room that has all kinds of flammable things. In fact, it's called the lamp room because that's where lamp oil was stored. There's also a lot of hay on the ground. There's oily rags. And so when he opens the door to the storage shed or storage room fully, uh, he doesn't know this, but he's providing this smoldering fire with a burst of oxygen coming in from side vents. And that turns the smoldering fire into an engaged growing fire almost instantly. And he tries to whap it out with a, you know, a tarpaulin, but he can't quite pull that off. 
And so he just runs. He runs to uh, get to a voice tube to call for some help. But he makes the fateful decision of leaving the door open. He's never been trained. Nobody in the fire on Slocum has been trained in any way, shape, or form about fire safety. And so had he shut the storage door behind him, he probably would have contained the fire and there would have been time to put it out and or at least certainly get the boat to safety. But he left the door open. And there's a diagram in the book that shows where, you know, what the sort of a side cutaway view of the ship is. And when you see where the fire begins, that, right at the base of that stairwell, a three, you know, three set of stairs that ascend three high flights. And that to a fire is like a chimney. And, you know, in the, what a fire wants, actually more than wood or fabric or anything else, a fire wants oxygen. And so that fire is literally going to be pulled right out the door of that storage shed and right up that set of stairs in just a matter of seconds. And so pretty early on, well before anybody's trying to fight the fire, it is seriously engaged. And quick reminder, the boat is made almost entirely of wood and almost all the paint and varnish is highly flammable. Again, something that's different from our time. Right, right. You you write that over time, it had been soaked with uh, linseed oil and turpentine to, yes. to make the boards more flexible. Yeah, I mean, lots of lots of chemicals to make it look good and also to make it uh, durable. And so they all of them are highly, highly flammable. Somebody at one point after the fire said it was built like a bonfire, you know, just almost like it was built to to burst into flames. Obviously, that wasn't the intent, but uh, that the accumulation of all that paint and all of that wood meant that it was just going to be a perfect confluence of factors to make it a terrible, terrible disaster. Right. And this deckhand, his name was John Coakley. He hadn't really worked on the ship for long. I think it was just a few days. Right. He was inexperienced on the Slocum and probably pretty inexperienced overall. One of these guys who kind of bounced around the waterfront and, you know, judging from his his um, work ethic, that having been uh, sipping on a beer, at about 9 a.m. suggests that he may not have been long for that job. Uh, so he was not a level-headed ex- and experienced person to, d- to be told, you know, to discover the fire. And so his bumbling led to the fire getting much, much worse. And then there were other factors that played into the fire just simply quickly getting out of control. Right, right. So it's, it's a mess. Coakley doesn't call the captain, but he dashes across the ship to find the first mate, a guy named Ed Flanagan. And Flanagan uses a speaking tube to call the engineer, mm-hmm. a man named Conklin, who runs to the pump. And, and who knows when the pump had last been tested, right? Yeah. I mean, at some point, the boat is 13 years old. So at some point, they probably tested the, you know, the, the, the system here and there, but they certainly hadn't done it in, many, in recent years. And so almost nobody on the boat had ever uh, done any kind of fire test. Like, what do you do if there's a fire? Who do you talk to first? And then how do you hook up the hoses and, you know, proceed to fight the fire? None of that had ever happened. So then a deckhand named Collins grabs the nozzle of the hose. He, he uh, makes for the lamp room, but the hose has twists and kinks, like all of us who have a garden hose at home are familiar with. Mm-hmm. And the problem was that when the water hit those kinks, the hose was so old that it began bursting in multiple places, spraying the deck with water. Yeah, it created sort of an extra level of pressure in certain spots. And the hose was probably going to burst, you know, crack leaks anyway, because it was so old. But it uh, really popped in a couple of places. And so nothing more than a drizzle came out of the nozzle. And within just a very short period of time, the guys who were, you know, the the frontline fighters of the fire, the you know the really the last best hope for the people on board, just simply dropped the hose and ran because they 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 didn't have a supply of water and they didn't know what else to do and so they just um, kind of you know headed for the exits. Yeah, the first mate uh, Flanagan, you, you write, just completely panics. He, he starts screaming to drop the the lifeboats. Right. Yeah. Head for the lifeboats. You know, and every person for themselves. And in the meantime, a, a, a boy finds the captain and tells him that the ship is on fire, and the captain just basically ignores him. Right. He was yeah, annoyed, you know, assuming uh, that the kid was, you know, uh, a real life Tom Sawyer with a job, or a, a, that he was a kid with a, a Tom Sawyer like imagination who was seeing steam, 
emitting from the kitchen or steam emitting from the power mechanism and that uh, had seen that you know had come to had thought that that must be a fire and was telling the captain so the captain was really irritated by that partly also because false shouting of fire could lead to stampedes and people dying even though there is no fire so any mention of fire w- would have been really annoying to the captain especially because he was convinced there was no fire not for long of course so a crewman finally reports to captain van shaik that there is a fire on board what is his reaction to that news yeah so van shaik's first reaction because he's a seasoned veteran and knows what to do is go find out for himself so he steps out of the pilot house to kind of go towards where he thinks the fire is and he steps out and he sees the fire is has exploded out of the port side of the vessel and is, you know, a lot of fire pouring out of the side of the vessel. And he knows just from that one snapshot that the, there must be a gigantic fire below decks, one that he could, they could never hope to extinguish. Uh, so he knows what might've been a small fire or no fire at all. It turns out to be really a cataclysmic fire and that he now has to figure out what he can do in the next minute or two in order to, uh, mitigate the, you know, the situation and hopefully lose no lives or lose the fewest number of lives. Right, right. So from the moments when members of the crew are making their uh, lame attempts to put out the fire to the point where the fire has made it above deck and, and is creating absolute terror for passengers, it, it all happens really quickly, right? It does, because the ship, you know, if you just think about this, you don't have to know much about fires, but the ship is made completely out of wo- uh, wood and flammable paint, and it's moving forward at 15 knots. So every kid in America, every old person in America by now has heard the phrase stop, drop, and roll, right? If you ever catch fire, dro- don't run because you'll fan the flames. Stop, drop, and roll. And so the General Slocum is on fire, and it is effectively running at a really fast rate. And the fire, just by chance, is in the forward part of the vessel. So the fire has two thirds of the vessel to, to claim, you know, push backwards, move backwards at a rapid rate uh, to, to the stern end of the uh, vessel eventually. So it is being fanned and pushed back. And, you know, as people find out about the fire, they begin to run to the stern of the ship, trying to get away from it. But the fire, you know, is bearing down on them because the vessel is moving at such a fast rate. And there's, again, so, what the fire wants is oxygen. And there's so much oxygen. It's essentially an open deck vessel and it is moving at a rapid rate, pouring fresh oxygen into the vessel and feeding that uh, furious fire. There are so many accounts in your book from surviving passengers about the horrors that were witnessed this day, far more than we have time to discuss here. And you make a point in, in your book to talk about the different ways that humans, in the face of something so utterly terrifying, react. Mm. Some people react with with pure panic. Others manage to stay calm, cool. Mm. And Pastor Haas was one of those people who remained composed. Right. I mean, most, it's really interesting. I did a lot of research into the psychology of panics and psychology of crises and so forth. What do people do? And the fact is most people panic or most people are consumed with fear anyway. And that's why you know, historically, when you see that there's, you know, people tearing other people apart to get to food in a famine situation, or people stomping on people uh, to get away from a, you know, or at a concert or a a soccer game where there's uh, a stampede happening, people who are normally very compassionate, level-headed, kind, compassionate people uh, end up killing people because they are so consumed with fear. There's this primal instinct to save oneself that you'll You'll do anything. And so there's a lot of that happening uh, on board the, the Slocum. And Haas is one of those, maybe it's 10% of us, uh, who has an ability to kind of, he's obviously terrified, but he masters his terror and is able to like direct people to, to do things. He himself recognizes that if he can close some of the doors in the inner cabins ahead of the fire, he might slow its advance because it's moving from front to back. And he gets badly burned in that process. He also encourages people to move to the stern. Um, really a, a, a model kind of uh, response and one that people said didn't surprise them because he was such a, I don't know, a sterling individual. Although that doesn't necessarily mean you would do that in a panic, but it turned out that's the way he reacted. Right. 
And the steamer is so large that while some people are already escaping the fire by jumping overboard, this is early on, in another part of the boat, the band continues to play. Yeah. <laughs> people are, are dancing and oblivious to the... Right, because one of the things that's happening on the boat is it's a, it's a party. So kids are screaming, people are shouting, there's music playing, people are laughing and clapping and dancing on the back. You know, the stern is where the... Um, the dance, the, the the band was set up. So when people start to scream and shout and make you know a cacophony of noise at the forward section of the ship, it takes a, a minute or two, which is a ton of time in this circumstance, for people to figure out that they're actually hearing screams of terror and not you know shouts of joy and kids uh, frolicking about. And at that moment, everybody says the same thing. There's and the reason I, I'm able to tell the story that. I, the way that I am is because every, so many people give very detailed testimony to reporters and then to the various investigations. And almost everybody says the same thing. I suddenly, I heard a scream or suddenly I realized those weren't shouts for joy. Those were screams. And I could, you know, almost simultaneously, I could smell smoke or suddenly I could make out what I was hearing, which was fire. Someone was shouting fire. And, you know, there's that kind of freeze moment which again psychologists talk about when uh, you know an animal or a human being hears like a loud noise or a roar of a tiger or something your first instinct is freeze and then you have to decide what you're going to do are you going to fight you're going to flee etc and so people had that freeze moment and then for many people their immediate reaction as they snapped out of that freeze was where are the children because the vessel gave people this false sense of security because it was basically a giant playground with a big fence all the way around it. You know, the decking was all fenced in. And so they gave the kids the run of the place. And so kids were often, you know, quite a ways away from their parents, maybe with a couple of older kids. And so when people towards the back end of the boat realized the fire was was on, you know, they, they all looked at each other, where are the children? And so many, you know, couples separated, the husband going off to look for children and the wife taking like some other children or their babies and uh, making for the railings. Yeah, there, there is this wall of flame, basically, which is chasing people, and those who don't move quickly enough are stampeded to death. Yeah, yeah. The, the terror is so great that people are, you know, they're they're moving to the edges, they're moving to the railings, and then some, again, some people that are sort of keeping their heads, they're saying, uh, there are a number of firsthand testimonies of mothers who said, okay, children, follow me, and they, you know, swing the leg over the railing, get everybody on the other side of the railing. So they're basically hiking out, like hanging off the boat, and seemingly in a pretty safe spot. And then suddenly out of nowhere, 40, 50 people come running down the deck in a complete sheer blind terror. And they literally crash through the uh, railing and pull everybody into the into the water. Numerous cases of, of that happening where the these packs of people were so terrorized they would run through people and through railings and uh, push everybody uh, into the water. So, so back to the life preservers. People are desperately trying to get at them. They're hanging from above, enclosed in this rusty wire. And when they're finally pulled loose, there, there's this crazy scene where all of these rotten preservers rain down on, on them. The cork is crumbling t into dust yep. and the cork dust is, is blinding people too, right? And people are pulling on them too, you know, not necessarily get fighting over them, but people are pulling on them. And so it's creating this strange scene of, of people getting face faces full of, of cork dust um, as they're thinking they're, they've just secured something that's going to save their lives and the lives of their children. And then the people who do find life preservers that, that seem intact they start putting them on their children first right of course and anybody would and then they drop these poor children into the water first right because nobody knows how to swim for the most part so the you know there are, there's a scene i describe where a mother you know takes each of her children one by one you know and, and with the help of i think her oldest son you know puts a life preserver on them and then you know can you imagine tosses them overboard thinking though that she's just saved their lives. And it turns out, I, I can't remember distinct, exactly, but nearly all of them drowned, were found drowned. And many of them with you know the life preservers still around their necks because the cork dust had turned, basically turns to mud or sand when it, when it hits water. And so 
in the aftermath, many people say these were not life preservers, these, these were life killers. And it's, it's one of those tragedies within the tragedy. So the lifeboats, were they ever able to get them out, down? They were not. Uh, they were they were you, all around the deck, all around the vessel. There are people at various points trying to pull down life preservers uh, and also trying to get these lifeboats, rocking them back and forth, trying to snap the wires. And people are doing it with their bare hands. So, you know, men are, you know, seeing they're cutting the wires, cutting into their fingers as they're trying to uh, loosen these, bo- these boats. The boats are also somewhat painted to the deck as well. So both wire and paint. And even if they had been able to free one up, it's unlikely they would have been able to you know, maybe get it into the water, maybe get a few people into it. But the boat is hauling, you know, at 15 knots. So these lifeboats were really designed to be lowered very carefully on a ship that was at, at rest or barely moving at all. So it was a uh, had they even had the opportunity to get the lifeboats free, they probably would not have done any good. Yeah, yeah. You write that at a certain point as passengers see this fire approaching and and they're dashing to outrun it in this just mad chaotic scene they eventually get as far as they can right they're they're pressed against the rails people are pushing and pushing and, and some start tossing children overboard right just throwing them into the water and, and in one example of this you 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 document in in your book a man, as he's about to throw a little girl over the side, he says to her, I would rather see you drown than burn to death. Mm. And that was the decision they believed they faced. That was the calculus, yeah. I mean, talk about a grim choice that you have about three seconds to make. But uh, And the reason he, that he... He's pretty sure, you know, it's most likely none of these people, you know, are going to be able to swim to save themselves. But by the time they're tossing people over, there's quite a number of boats, big boats, small boats, rowboats, tugboats, everything are following the General Slocum. Uh, They've sort of fallen in line behind this unfolding disaster, and they are plucking people out of the water here and there. So there's a sense that if I can just get my child or, you know, these people into the water, it's still probably not 50-50, but there's a chance that they will float long enough for somebody to pluck them out of the water. So the Slocum is barreling along with these smaller boats chasing it. Why doesn't the captain stop the ship so people can be rescued by these pursuing boats? Right. That's one of the big aftermath questions was the captain had this amazing safety, safety record and tremendous experience. And he knew the water, that waterway in, you know, like the back of his hand. And so he has a couple of choices. One, when he finds out the fire is really serious, is a, a, when many a captain would uh, stop the boat dead in its tracks or like turn it around actually. And so that it was dead in the water, which is the nautical equivalent of stop, drop and roll, right? Don't feed the fire by roaring ahead, stop. And that would also allow all the the boats that are following it uh, to come right along the sides and people, allow people to drop people into boats. Um, it would, you know, the fire would continue to grow but there might have just enough time to get a, you know, many, many, if not everybody, you know, off the vessel. So that was really the, the the one question that people had in their minds was why didn't you do what was considered basic protocol, which be in these circumstances is to stop. The other one was simply to head for shore. You know, this is the East River uh, is not actually a river; it's an estuary. But on both sides of the river, it's incredibly narrow, and you can see in great detail in the spot where they were when the fire was going that it. It, you're only a few hundred yards away from, you know, commercial piers on the Manhattan side and commercial piers on the Brooklyn and Queens side. So many people said, why didn't you just put it hard over to one side or the other and make for one of those piers? And, you know, he later said that he feared that if he pulled one the vessel up to a commercial pier that, you know, there might be oil tanks there, it might set fire, you know, it might cause an explosion. And so his third option was, because he knew the area so well, he said, yeah, well, just up ahead, is a small island uh, called North Brother Island, and it has a kind of a small beach. And so he says to himself, if I can just get up there and kind of like swing the boat in to this beach, it'll run aground maybe in four or five feet of water, and that will allow plenty of people to get off and and to help people to, to shore. Plus there's a hospital on the island, so there's medical staff there. And it turns out, you know, that was just the wrong move because it was a pretty much longer than probably he thought to get there several minutes at full throttle 
uh, to get there. So the whole, that part of the journey is where most of the people are pouring over the sides of the ship and drowning and eventually does get to North Brother Island. Yeah. At one point, as he's pushing his ship to this island, he second guesses himself and orders that the boat be turned. And it, and it turns hard to the port side. Yep. And this sends people clinging to the railings into the water. Mm. You, you describe it in your book like a waterfall of people. And then he changes his mind again, wants to go back to the island, and he does it again. Yeah, suggesting a, a level of panic, right? He, he says, you know, he's in his mind, he's second guessing himself. And at one point he says, hard over to port. And, uh, you know, that causes the boat to lurch to the, to the left or to the port. And uh, yeah, all kinds of people that were hanging on were swept overboard. And then he almost immediately countermands his order and just says, never mind, let's just do, I'm committed. You know, we're committed to beaching it on North Brother Island. And, and to give an idea of, of how hot it is, there is one moment where a woman has her hand on the railing and she can't remove it. it it's been seared to the metal. Yeah, the uh, all that paint and varnish um, has melted, you know, it's 3,000, 3,500 degree heat and she's hanging over the side and in possibly, gonna, in fact, she is saved, but um, she has to literally tear her hands from the railing because they have adhered to the railing because of all that melted paint and varnish. And uh, she was at that point, a, you know, a young woman who was uh, a pretty good pianist and uh, never was able really to play the piano again because of the injuries. So as you've said, most of the people on board were not swimmers, but a few were. But that didn't mean much, because even if you were the best swimmer in the world, once you hit the water, you would be met with those who couldn't, and they would try and grab onto you in desperation. Right. I mean, this, is, this comes from my, you know, my experience growing up as a lifeguard. So when you're in lifeguard training, um, as I was as a teenager, they about 80% or 70% of what you learn in lifeguard training is how not to be drowned by the person you're trying to save. And that's a real insight because you realize that what they're, and what they're telling you is that when someone is drowning and you approach them as a lifeguard or a potential lifesaver, they look at your head like it's a piece of land. And they, again, may be a perfectly normal, level-headed, kind, compassionate, selfless person. But in that white heat of panic, they will lunge at you and lock on you with superhuman strength and what was a single drowning becomes a double drowning. So lifeguards are trained with, you know, with all these defensive maneuvers and ways to, to not get grabbed by a drowning victim. And so in, in the case of the Slocum, uh, nobody has that training. And, and so people that can swim, though, are bobbing in the water with all kinds of people around them. Uh, if, anybody, if you saw the movie Titanic, you have a sense, there's a couple of moments where they replicate that thing where um, Rose and Jack are in the water and suddenly, you know, somebody comes leaps at them and pulls them underwater. That's very realistic. And so you were, you'd saved yourself from the fire. You were lucky enough to how to swim. And now you had to save yourself from all these really wildly panicked drowning victim, drowning victims who, who were potentially going to drown you. Yeah. In one account, you write about a man who was a good swimmer and he jumped off the railing holding his daughter's hands. He had two daughters, one in each hand. But another guy, a, a large man, jumped in directly after them. And he apparently landed on top of the man with the daughters. So when the man with the daughters, when his body was later recovered, he, he basically had an imprint of the other man's shoe on his head. Yeah, the heel marks. Oh, yeah, because they had mark, jumped yeah. simultaneously. There was no organization, so people were literally, and it, you know, it could have also been um, that he, so they jumped simultaneously from two different decks. You know, one above the other. But uh, yeah, so people were were, and just the impact. Even you know, the chances of that guy with those two children of hanging on to both of those children in the impact, jumping in that in the water like that, uh, was probably pretty pretty slim to begin with. And then there's the other factor which we haven't mentioned yet, which is that these people are all dressed. These non-swimmers are all dressed in their Sunday best. So men are wearing full wool suits and shoes and overcoats and hats. And women are wearing, you know, Victorian era dresses that have many, many layers and 
and they're you know tightly bound to their bodies and uh, stockings and shoes and boots and so if you are you know just in your shorts and you don't know how to swim and you get jump in the and you get thrown in the water you have about 90 seconds maybe 2 minutes of wild flailing that will keep you above water uh and maybe somebody rescues you but if you are dressed like that you have got just a handful of seconds because the the weight of your clothing uh and and all is going to and your inability to tread water and to and to swim is going to uh, pull you under pretty quickly right and another danger for those in the water were the paddles on either side of the ship right if you were forward forward of the paddles uh these are huge churning wheels um and the you know as it as the vessel goes forward they're creating kind of a draw to the to the wheels so if you even if you jump five six feet off the ship uh there's a chance particularly if you don't know how to swim and, and kind of guide yourself away that you might get pulled right underneath those wheels and they're you know you're as good as dead because they are you know they're ch- pounding the water with these great big wooden scoops right so the general slocum eventually grounds right the, the bow is in seven feet of water the stern in 30 feet of water So it was the worst of of both worlds, right? Still too deep for people to touch the bottom with their feet. Yeah, I mean, that little bit of, you know, 10 feet of water is just as good as a million feet of water because it's over your head. Right. But but it was also too shallow, right, for for rescue boats to safely approach. Right. It was sort of the worst of every, you know, like the whole fire itself, you know, the worst convergence of factors. And then that scene at North Brother Island also was pretty bad. So instead of getting the stern towards the beach, the stern is stuck out in the deepest water furthest from shore. And um, it's also, it's too shallow for people to to touch bottom and walk themselves to shore, but it's for many of these vessels too shallow for them to get in close. And this is all happening in in view of, of hundreds, if not thousands of onlookers, right? I mean, this isn't some lonely stretch of land surrounding them. It's New York City. Right. And it's in its middle of the morning on a beautiful day, you know, so no obstructions. And word spread fast, you know, as the the boat was moving its way up the East River, consumed by flames, you couldn't help but notice and hear the screams and shouts um, and watch it all unfold. And if you did miss it, uh, the media got there really fast and took down, you know, just astonishing detail uh, accounts from people telling their story and looking for their their family members. There were many acts of bravery, right? Many people who risked their lives trying to get to the Slocum. Yeah, it's the one of the, um, in, a, in a book that I enjoyed every minute of writing, but you know, it was pretty heavy writing quite a bit of the time. Um, the rescue stories and the kind of things that people did, you know, risking life and limb uh, were pretty astonishing to, to read about and then to try to translate into the into the narrative. Uh, yeah, and there's one small tugboat in particular where uh, it's a small tugboat, so it's it's a little bit undersized and therefore draws less water. And the guy, you know, brings the tugboat in, and as he's bringing it in, you know, the rigging is catching on fire, the paint is melting, the glass in the pilot house starts to pop and explode. His hair catches on fire. His crewman's, you know, clothing and hair starts to catch on fire, and he just goes right up to the stern, you know, several thousand degrees of heat. And uh, lashes his boat to the to the slocum and pulls. You know the estimates varied, but you know scores of people onto his little tugboat, and then almost doesn't get away because his the propeller gets caught in the line. But they do get away, and he's one of the great heroes of the day. There's lots of individual heroes who row small boats out and uh, or who know how to swim and they guide somebody to shore. But uh, the that tugboat captain was was really one of the signature heroes of the day. Yeah, yeah, the first mate. Ed Flanagan, he jumped onto the tugboat and tried to untie it. Uh, right. a, a pretty cowardly act. Right. Right. I mean, and you know, I, I always try to cut these people slack, but it is hard not to think of him as a coward, you know, just a, like a totally selfish kind of figure. But he is one also overcome by that, you know, by that terror um, of the fire and really not, doesn't have his wits about him. But it's a bad look, to say the least, that a one of the crew members that was one of the principal failures that led to the fire getting so bad is also quite selfishly trying to cast off before enough people get on board the the small tug. Yeah. So the people of New York City, especially in Little Germany, really did pull together 
and lend a helping hand to both the survivors and the surviving family members of those killed. Yes, it was, uh, you know, humanity at its best. Um, and in little Germany, people obviously is a tremendous blow. And, you know, when over a thousand people die in a small neighborhood, largely all from that same neighborhood, everybody knows somebody that was uh, on that boat and, and, and died. And so part of the, you know, the community comes together to help identify, help people find lost relatives, to, you know, create a system by which the missing can be accounted for. Um, and then eventually once they realize how many people have perished, they set up, uh, the city sets up a big morgue not far away and the community helps kind of organize that and, uh, you know, in under controlled circumstances, allowing people to go view the dead to see if they can identify people. And simultaneously, they're raising, you know, at the time was huge amounts of money, largely to, to cover funeral expenses and also to help families get by for a few weeks. Uh, there were a lot of husbands who were uh, left with some of their family because the most of the people on board were women, children, and retired folks because it was a work day. And so there's a lot of families that are really shattered and both psychologically, but also financially. And so they did really pull together to do as much as they could to show sympathy, to show compassion, and also really like help them in practical ways. So what about the owner of the ship, Frank Barnaby? What was his reaction when he learned news of the tragedy? Yeah, I mean, you don't want to draw, you know, in any conclusions by, based on a person's face. But if you see the pictures of Frank Barnaby in the book, you, he just looks like a slippery character. I mean, he looks like he's almost, you know, cast for the movie version of it. He's <laughs> just has that kind of, you know, shifty way about him. And so he wants to save himself and not be liable for this terrible tragedy for which he is liable and for which it is largely on him that it happens because he runs this, you know, steamship company with on the cheap. What he does is he orders his secretary to doctor the books. So there were there were new life preservers had been ordered and put on the other boat, uh, the Grand Republic. And so he has her effectively white out those receipts and change the name to General Slocum so that it would appear that the life preservers on the Slocum were in fact new life preservers and the stories of the life preservers being rotten and falling apart were just crazy tales told by hysterical women who in their panic tore the perfectly good life preservers apart. So that was his his first line of defense was to sort of blame it on the victims and, uh, and and kind of play the gender card too, you know, sensing saying that it was panicked hysterical women that lost their minds and destroyed their only means of sa- salvation. Yeah. And as part of his attempt at damage control, he dispatched a boat. They found the captain, members of the crew and they and they got them out of there to isolate them. Right. I mean, it's a, it's a classic. We see this sometimes in, in modern times, but he wanted to get everybody who was involved away from the police, away from the journalists so that nobody would say anything incriminating. And, you know, we don't have any evidence, but it sure seemed like it was the proverbial, let's get our story straight here, guys. And, um, but eventually the investigators uh, do find these people and hearings, you know, inquisitions are held by the coroner's office where they take testimony under oath. And the story begins to slowly but surely tumble out about the actual condition of the vessel, conditions of the life preservers and the hoses and the lifeboats, and the incredibly bad behavior of the untrained crew, all leading to this incredible tragedy. Barnaby wasn't finished after that either, right? He fought the city when it wanted to raise the ship because there were more bodies to recover trapped inside. He, he tried to prevent them from doing it. Right. He was, you know, interested in covering his, his tracks. And so he didn't want the, the vessel to be raised because it would produce, it would boost the, the body count for sure. And it would give inspectors an opportunity to go in and take a look at all the firefighting equipment that was still, you know, fastened in place and notice that mo- none of the, you know, the fire uh, water valves had been turned except the one that um, in that one moment of trying to put out the fire. And there were lots of other pieces of evidence that, that really made clear that the, the vessel was ill-prepared for this kind of incident. Was anyone held accountable for this? Was anyone punished? Well, lots of people faced, in, you know, there were more than 10 indictments that were handed down, mostly for the crew um, and for some of the officers of the company. But the captain was the, the principal person that the prosecution focused on. And 
he bore the brunt of it because by maritime law and custom, it's his ship. And so even though he didn't defer on buying new life preservers and making sure that the fire hoses were adequately up to date, he is technically responsible. It's his ship. And so he should have resigned or he should have pushed the company to do the right thing. Um, and what he did is basically grin and bear it. You know, he knew the company wasn't going to put up the money to buy new life preservers or new fire equipment. And he also never did any kind of fire drills. Maybe he thought it was pointless because of the condition of the firefighting apparatus on board the vessel. So he was the one found principally guilty for the condition of the ship um, and the, the, the fact that the crew was not trained. And so he receives a 10 year prison sentence um, found guilty. He really is the scapegoat for the whole uh, operation. Frank Barnaby and any, none of the other folks who own the, the company were faced any time and none of the other uh, deckhands faced any time. So it was just, just on the captain. The inspector Lundberg didn't either. Right. Right. Exactly. He, he didn't. Um, he, and he's another one of those people that just sort of disappeared soon thereafter, but he, he faced no, no prosecution. Uh, and he was able to sort of say, well, it looked fine to me, you know, and things were, things were in good shape to me. And uh, there was no way to tell whether, you know, cause people were alleging, of course, in this era that he probably took a bribe, right? He took a $10 bill to like poke around the vessel and be on his way. There's no way to prove that, but that was the custom of the day. Um, and so he obfuscated what had actually happened and, you know, blamed the, the captain and everything else. And yeah, he escaped prosecution as well. Did, did this force dramatic changes? Did it lead to improved safety conditions on steamships? Of course, more people were now aware of the potential dangers now. Yes. I mean, this is, a you know, if ever there was a template for a disaster and then the aftermath, this is it, where the disaster happens, over a thousand people are killed, and very quickly, the United States, Theodore Roosevelt is president at this point, and he's a reformer and a guy who hates corruption, really hates corruption and malfeasance. And so the U.S. Steamship Inspection Service is completely cleaned out and revamped Real professionals are put in place, and they begin the process of writing new uh, codes and coming up with new regulations for steamships to, for example, to require that all vessels of a certain length have to have sprinklers on board. So not just fire hoses, but sprinklers and many other things that would have saved a lot of lives. So after the fire, uh, steamships in America become much, much safer. And, uh, you know, so many lives are saved in the aftermath, but it took it came at a very high price. There's a monument, right, that honors the victims of the disaster. Yeah, there are two monuments. There's a small one right in the heart of Little Germany. It's a water fountain, and you might just walk right past it and not know it. But it's uh, one dedicated to the children, uh, the hundreds of children that died uh, in the fire. And that, that has been recently, or I say recently, probably 10 years ago, was completely re restored. So the, you know, the carvings in the marble are actually look uh, you can actually see what's going on there. And I think there's a little plaque next to it that tells you what it is. But the big monument is out in Queens, um, the borough where there are a lot of big cemeteries, including the big cemetery where most of the victims uh, were buried. And at one spot where there's about 60 or so unidentified uh, bodies, un unidentified remains, they put them in a mass grave and put on top of it a very large, beautiful sculpture that is the, you know, the General Slocum monument. So when people go to learn more about the fire or when family members would go to sort of pay their respects on, on an annual basis, um, that is often where people found themselves. Oh, gosh. Well, I appreciate you coming on to talk about this. It's, it's such an intense, sad story. And unfortunately, the tragedy didn't end once the remaining bodies washed up on shore or were pulled out of the wreckage, there, there were some who just couldn't cope with the loss of their family members and turned to suicide. Yeah, the trauma was so great that there's many reports of particularly husbands, you know, fathers who lost their wife and five kids, their wife and seven kids, their wife, seven kids, and their brother-in-law and sister, sister, and they're, you know, like, you know, many, tragedy one can't really even conceive of. And so, you know, one year, two years, three years, four years down the road, many of these folks are, are dying by suicide. And then, of course, a large number of people that um, died by simply drinking themselves to death, you know, just uh, alcoholism as a coping mechanism and uh, 
So it was a long, the tragedy played out for, for quite some time. And you mentioned a lot of the survivors. You know, I, I literally two days ago got an email from somebody who is a great grandson or something. I can't remember exactly what the figures are, but it was saying, you know, the subject line of the email was descendant of General Slocum Fire. So I do get correspondence, you know, sometimes six months will go by, but I would say two or three times a year now, even 20 years after publishing the book, um, getting notes from people or people wondering, having questions like, whatever happened to this person, or I'm the descendant of this person, and I don't know, uh, I don't have any follow up information on whatever happened to them, uh, you know, a deckhand or a member of the uh, of the one of the passengers who survived. So I occasionally I'm able to piece some things together for some folks. Uh, I, I don't want to forget about Pastor Haas since we talked about his experience on the ship. Yeah. Did he make it out? Well, Pastor Haas lost his wife, uh, his daughter, his sister, several other members of his family. He survived. His, one of his sons survived. And, you know, he was badly burned. And he, he, he insisted on going to his wife's funeral just a couple of days after the fire. I mean, a man in no condition to do so did so. And there's a photograph in the book of him leaving his home to get into a carriage to go out to Queens to the, to the burial, for the burial of his, of his wife. So kind of a, you know, a remarkable figure. And if ever somebody had an excuse to get the heck out of that neighborhood, it was Reverend George Haas. He had lots, as I said, lots of offers for other jobs over the years. He's very smart, very eloquent, um, offers to be a college professor or, you know, a seminary professor. And he didn't, he returned them all down. He stayed in, um, in little Germany for another 20 years before his death. So decided to just kind of ride it out. And uh, he felt like the the diminishing but still existent German community needed him. And that was where, you know, fate had placed him and he decided to stay. Wow. Well, it is nice to, to leave this on a little bit of an upbeat note. Mm -hmm. Anyone wanting to discover more about the General Slocum, this book, your other books, your work in general, you have a comprehensive website. Yeah, people can find out. It's, uh, you know, my full name is Edward T, as in Thomas, Edward T. O'Donnell. And if you just go to edwardtodonnell.com, you can find out all about me. Um, there's actually some info, info on uh, the General Slocum there. There's a tab for that. Um, and on, on social media, uh, my handle for all my social media is in the pass lane, uh, which is with a P. So I-N-T-H-E-P-A-S-T-L-A-N-E. -E. Very clever, of course, uh, for a historian. And um, yeah, it's, and I'm very active on social media, you know, uh, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and TikTok increasingly so. And you did have a podcast for a while as well. Yes, In the Past Lane was my podcast. And all the episodes, all 200 episodes are still available um, everywhere you get podcasts. And a lot of the uh, episodes that I really enjoyed the most were um, like this one, where you interview somebody, where I interviewed a historian about their books. Um, and it, you know, it, at one point, what happened was at one point I, I decided that I, I didn't have enough time. I had to choose. I, I could interview p historians about their new books or I could stop the podcast and write my next new book. So that's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, gosh, again, thank you for making some time for us today. It's been great. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks so much. Once more, my guest today has been Professor Edward O'Donnell. He is the author of Ship Ablaze, The Tragedy of the Steamboat General Slocum. This has been another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast, broadcasting to every dark and cobwebbed corner of the world. I'm Eric Rivenis, and have a safe tomorrow.